Greetings. It's time for our supercomputing update, which I do twice per year. Supercomputing is, of course, the purest measurement of technological progress for multiple reasons. It is a better measure of computing than personal computers because personal computers have to account for a large number of customer-focused look and feel features, such as weight, energy consumption, aesthetics, and so forth. And that is just for desktop PCs. For laptop PCs and phones, it's even more. Whereas a supercomputer only has enterprise-grade clients many of which are remote, not even on site to the supercomputer. Most people have never seen a supercomputer. If you were to see one, you would just see corridors upon corridors of computing closets, racks of computers in cabinets with corridors in between, and a very cold temperature in the facility. So supercomputing is ultimately the purest measurement of computing progress, and therefore the purest measurement of technological progress. The only candidate of similar caliber is energy efficiency per dollar of output, as in separate metrics that I speak about on this channel. So we go to top500.org, which is a website that has for a very long time now, I think 30 years or so, kept track of the top most supercomputers in the world and compiled lists of them in order to keep these statistics up to date. And we see this chart over here. And here's how you interpret this chart. Calendar years as the horizontal axis, of course. And the vertical axis is a measurement of floating point operations per second. Teraflops, petaflops, and exaflops. Teraflops, of course, is a trillion. Petaflops is 10 to the 15th power, a quadrillion, and exaflops is 10 to the 18th power, a quintillion. And of these three lines, this middle line is the least interesting of the three because that is merely the performance of the number one supercomputer in the world, which usually gives up the number one ranking very quickly after a new supercomputer is created that is even more powerful. The blue line is the lowest member of the top 500 list, the number 500 ranking. This is somewhat interesting because we see this flattening out because these on-demand services through Amazon, through Microsoft, etc., have a subscription type model for supercomputing where you can rent supercomputing even for just an hour or so for $1,000 or whatever. This makes it much more accessible to smaller organizations and sometimes even individuals who have a supercomputing job that only is needed for an hour. And such on-demand capabilities, which are very Netflix-like in nature, might be swallowing up the lower end of supercomputing and there might come a time where we don't even have 500 standalone supercomputers in the world because these subscription services are eliminating supercomputers that are lower in power than what the subscription service provides, which would also be a natural progression of technology. On-demand supercomputing rental services would make a lot of sense in terms of computing access as a whole. So we'll see how this line peters out and what happens with it. But the most interesting and valuable line on this chart is this green one, which is the sum total of all of the top 500 supercomputers. Now how those subscription-based supercomputing services are calculated as a portion of this total, I do not know, but you have to have faith in a venerable website like top500.org to do that accurately. And we see here, what I've often mentioned is how things were on a certain trend line until 2013. And then it started to flatten because this existing computational architecture that we have been using for many, many years, which is what Moore's Law, etc., is also based on, is saturating and it takes more and more engineering creativity and expense to eke out each additional exponential unit of computing. So we see this as now on a lower trend line for 10 years now. This most recent dot is a little bit up, but we will see if that's just a noise level dot like this one over here versus a reversion forward in the trend line. And the good thing is this line is not under the control of any one corporation or even any one country. The United States or China or whatever cannot control this line because it's the sum total of all of the top 500 supercomputers. And therefore it is a real time measurement of where the state of computing power in the world is right now. Now on top500.org, they have this chart below the first one, which I don't like because this just takes the trend line from an Excel spreadsheet of all of the dots that we have in this chart. And this is therefore giving credit to this lower trend line, which I don't think should be the case. This was the trend line until 2013, and it should be considered the first principles trend line subsequent to 2013. And therefore we can measure how far behind we are 
in supercomputing power relative to where we should be. If anything, this should be accelerating more steeply due to the second derivative under the accelerating rate of change. But instead, I like to go to a chart that says the original trend line is in fact the valid one and underperformance in relation to that is a function of how far behind we are in terms of all technology to that trend line. Now for that, we go to part two of this video. Now in part two of this video, I've taken that top500.org chart and I've put my own trend line on the green top 500 summation line itself. Things were following a certain trend line until 2013 and then have just moved to a lower trend line because of the saturation of this old computing paradigm. Just to catch up to this trend line, if it were to catch up in say three years, we would need a 1000x gain in computing power, 1000x. That is huge, but that could happen because an innovation in computing gets us to a more advanced form of computing, which is what we should expect based on the historical progression of individual paradigms of computing. As Ray Kurzweil says, Moore's law is not the first paradigm of computing, it is the fifth paradigm, but we've been waiting for the sixth paradigm for quite some time. And this also ties to missing economic prosperity. Speaking of Ray Kurzweil, Many of the predictions he had made at the turn of the century for our time, 2020, 25, 30, most of those have not come true, but they're all behind by the same amount. Why? Because Ray Kurzweil thought that this trend line over here would continue uninterrupted, and he thought that by 2024, we would be here, not here. So computational power being only one one hundredth of what he thought it would be is the reason why a lot of his predictions are behind by seven to ten years, but they're all behind by the same amount. When I reviewed his books, as you can see elsewhere on this channel, I mentioned that as well. Now, obviously, we cannot catch up in a single day, but for us to catch up in even three years, we would have to be here. So a 1,000x catch up within three years. That would break a lot of economic models and cause a tremendous amount of technological disruption in the world, including toppling several nation states that are dependent on a certain type of tax revenue and a certain flow and have demonstrated an unwillingness to adapt to modern technological realities. At the same time, once the initial turmoil clears, there will be trillions upon trillions of dollars of new wealth created. Many people will be much more prosperous than they are today, and the aggregate would also be much more prosperous, although with a significant shuffling of the order. Therefore, this is something we have to anticipate, and it could begin at any point, or it could stay in this lower status quo for a few years based on which technology becomes the succeeding technologies, and multiple technologies could be successors. Many technologies have claimed themselves as candidates. We first had carbon buckyballs, then carbon nanotubes, then graphene, then DNA computing, then quantum computing. There was a lot of hype activity around quantum computing in 2016 or 17, but that obviously did not happen as those people predicted because in 2024, we still do not have mass market quantum computing, nor has anyone hacked the Bitcoin mining problem with quantum computing. That's how you would know if there's any secret quantum computers, because that would be the obvious first thing to do on day one, rapidly mine the unmined Bitcoin. Ultimately, a new computing paradigm will emerge that reverts us back up to this trend line and even steepens it up a bit under the accelerating rate of change. And all the social and economic effects I mentioned will manifest then, but that is something to watch for. Again, 1000x would need to happen in three years for us to catch up to the trend line. But everything we know about the first principles and about all studies of futurism indicate that this should occur. And the area enclosed by these two lines represents this missing economic prosperity. The stock market should be quite a bit higher than it is now, and most technological devices that you have should be quite a bit cheaper than they are now, because, as I said, we should be seven to ten years further along in technological progress, and thus economic progress as well. And I have many videos on this channel about that phenomenon, but this is always something to watch for because every other technological change and economic and social change derived from that is downstream from this indicator. Always keep that in mind. Now, if you like this type of content, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel and thank you very much for watching. Technological singularity, singularity, Elon Musk, Tesla, inflation, Ray Kurzweil, Federal Reserve, inflation, hyperinflation, 
artificial intelligence, AI, Elon Musk, Tesla, Ray Kurzweil, technological singularity, singularity, universal basic income, technological disruptions. 